allow me a word of prayer. Father, help me to communicate these things. It has been an asset in my life. I want to share it with them. I thank you for this church. I thank you for these dear people here. I am so blessed as I travel across this country that I'm a part of this church every Sunday, no matter where I am. And this wonderful pastor who's faithful to do an amazing job and his dear lady, I ask that you honor your son today and may I get this point across because it has changed the way I look at life. And Father, I ask this in the only name among men whereby we are to be saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I tried to stick with the theme of Christmas. But I really wrestled over the fact, what in the world can I give after it's been taught how many times this, this month? And Ron never misses anything. He, he gets down to the, to the nitty-gritty. But I have learned over the years that uh, the ways that I try to communicate what happens to us and what, how we deal with life, I have, uh, in my mind, I begin to use this expression, you're either reacting to life or responding. And when you react, it's, it's all part of the flesh. It's the emotions that, over, oh, that, that override your life. You're seeing it strictly from where you are. But when you respond to life, you, you immediately move over into the process of saying, okay, uh, how's God looking at this? What's, how does God want me to look at this? When you react... Uh, you multiply the circumstances. You make it so personal. We get wrapped up in ourselves. But when you learn to respond because you ask yourself this question, what does God think about this? What does his word say about this circumstance? And when you start to look at life from the responding point of view, you save so much of the confusion that we go through. I don't have to tell you, your emotions will lie to you in a heartbeat. Your emotions have no content, and they have no thought pattern. They either react or respond based on your mental attitude and how you look at things. Obviously, we can only see from where we are. But because we have had the privilege of spending a few years studying the mind of Christ, and I try to tell people, this book... It's not a book. It's a man. And the word became what? Flesh. This book is the Savior. All the way from Genesis to Concordance. Don't try to read the Concordance. It's hard to find the, the, the key, key point there. But then I go back and say, now in the Christmas story, I think, first of all, Mary had a reaction when, when uh, the, the angel came to her and said, brace yourself. No. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to be pregnant, and you're going to bear a son. And she goes, how in the world is that going to happen? You see, that's, uh, that's looking at it from the reaction stage. But once he explained it to her, See her phenomenal response? Your bond servant. I'm honored to be the one chosen to bring forth the Messiah, the Savior. And then she responded, and obviously they didn't have any contact between her and Joseph to kind of let him in on that. Well, he went, uh, she went over, as you know, to Elizabeth, and uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth's going to bear a child. Now, she's up in years. So that, uh, that obviously was a delightful thing because apparently she's been praying that God would open her wound and she would have a son. Boy, did she have a son. One of the greatest men who ever walked the earth. Next to Christ, of course. And then, of course, uh, 
Zacharias, when the angel came to Zacharias and said, your wife is going to bear a son. I always wondered what was his first response. Uh, are you serious? Uh, I always wonder what, what did he say uh, that became so appropriate here? Shut my mouth. Well, that's what happened. He became mute. He couldn't talk until the son was born. Why? Because he did not believe the words that Gabriel brought. And when God's trying to convince you and I of something, how long does it take us to say, okay, Father, if this is your will, I'm all for it. Let's go. Let's go. Learning to respond to life. Now, there are times when reaction can be good. Some of you already know that I wrecked my van this last Wednesday. I was in a parking lot with my Ruthie and Tammy. They had, uh, we all showed up to say goodbye to a wonderful eye doctor who was retiring. And I, uh, had, I left my van running, and Tammy said, Dad, your, 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 your motor's running. All I know is I reached up to cut it off, and the car began to roll downhill. Now, I'm not in the kind of shape that I could have compensate physically on that mission because the leg that, that I needed action from is still messed up from the, even the surgery didn't, co didn't conquer the problem. It's very vulnerable. I have to be, I have to, when I walk, every step has to be deliberate. So, obviously, I wasn't able to negotiate jumping back in the van, so I just held on to the steering wheel, and it drugged me Downhill, <clears throat> and I kept thinking at that point, where's it going to stop? I'm about to do damage to somebody else's car. Well, it drug me, and when I finally came, uh, finally uh, stopped, the door had been so ajar that now it has to be fixed, and I'm not sure they can fix it, but anyway, I'm praying they will, because... That van and myself have been bonded for so many years. Plus, we just paid it off, you know. Isn't that strange? But anyway, uh, <clears throat> my, uh, uh, the, the uh, back of my foot was dragging the ground, and my other leg, it would have been just a matter of one or two different moves, and it would have run over me. Now, how do you explain that? I ran over myself in my vehicle. <laughs> But anyway, thank God, I came to rest, and uh, it left. It took some of my uh, right leg shin, uh, shin skin off. But anyway, there was no problem, except now they have to come and get it, and we'll see what happens. But <clears throat> Zacharias, he re he uh, reacted. The shepherds, they were very fearful when they saw angels. Wouldn't you and I be? Holy moly, what's this? Well, but then they said, let's go. Let's go check it out. They went from reaction to response, and they made right, right choices right there. <clears throat> Simeon, this man, I don't know, he probably hadn't made a bad choice in decades. He was there for one purpose, to wait to see the Messiah. And when they brought baby Jesus, he knew exactly what he, what he was looking at. And he rejoiced. He said, now I can die because I've waited up to this moment. And the Lord told me I would live till I saw the Messiah. And then uh, Anna was a prophetess in the temple and just a gracious, wonderful, loving lady who just did everything to bless everybody in her ministry. And she came and saw the Messiah, and she knew what she was looking at. It wasn't just another baby. And now when Jesus was 12 years old, uh, Mary and Joseph uh, were traveling, and they realized Jesus was not there. So they had to go back uh, and retrace their steps and find out where, where Jesus was. And there he was in the temple, wowing the professors of theology, the religious crowd. 
They were amazed how this young boy could know so much. And then Mary was very upset. Why have you done this to us? And Jesus goes, but you should have known that I would be about my what? My father's business. I was where I needed to be. Of course, he was 12 years old, and they consider that in the Jewish realm, they consider that almost uh, adulthood. And he certainly was doing what he knew the father wanted him to do. And I always wonder what Joe had to say. Joe didn't say anything uh, about all that. But he felt like uh, Mary. And I wondered if Jesus looked up and said, uh, Joe, huh, were you upset too? No. It's not in Scripture, but I, 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 I see these things. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of reaction in his life because it's very difficult to put together the fact that obviously if they were focused on the word of God, they would have not been so shocked about the fact that this virgin would conceive and bear a son. And of course, uh, after Joel reacted, you wonder, was he, did you think he would love her enough to say, it doesn't matter how I got here, I'm going to marry you, I'm going to take care of you, I'm going to, what? He was ready to just Check, check the, whole, the whole program in. Just say, well, you know. But then he got the revelation. Uh, I want you all to, to write down Luke 137. Of all the scripture that uh, we could have talked about today, that's a promise you need to hang on to. With God, nothing is what? Impossible. Nothing is impossible. So the Lord, uh, if you're alert and you're, you stay focused in your spiritual growth, God will always reveal his plan to you. The question is, are you willing to do whatever he calls you to do? At least when Joseph got the rest of the story, he immediately responded and realized this is amazing. This is all part of God's plan. And he was willing to be the man, not only to marry her, but to protect her. By the way, can you imagine when they finally uh, <clears throat> got to Nazareth? Can you imagine a pregnant woman on a donkey? You talk about endurance. You talk about patience. To ride a donkey all that way? Well, if you'll turn... To 2 Corinthians 12, I want to show you one of my greatest lessons on reaction versus response. 2 Corinthians 12. I love teaching this because what an illustration that now the Apostle Paul, and if you get into 2 Corinthians 11, you, he gives you his bragamony, but the Lord allowed him to do it. Paul was always the kind that wanted to prove that he happened to be ahead of the, his peers. Well, when the Lord finally called him, he changed his name from Saul, which is a name of uh, mighty status, of greatness, and he called him Paul. But I want you to know that I have discovered how he finally lived up to the name God gave him when he told him, I've called you to suffer great things for my name. Anybody want to volunteer for that mission? In my reading of scriptures, I'm, I'm, I'm stopping now as I've gone from Genesis all the way up. I'm in the book of Job again. And what a, what a lesson that is. If I had to summarize the book of Job in two words, I would say, don't ask. Whatever you do, don't ask. When he finally, after listening to the, uh, the three stooges, these were not friends. These were self-righteous Pharisees. They offered him no comfort. They didn't even take a cold rag to wipe his sweaty brow or offer him something to eat. All they did was attack him 
in their self-righteous arrogance. But anyway, I'm always fascinated to see that God would allow such a thing to happen to somebody he trusted. Now, Job reacted. He didn't curse God, but he cursed the day he was born. He said in so many words, I would have loved to have gone back and not be born. Or if I should have died the day I was born. I should have gone from the cradle to the grave immediately. <laughs> he reacted, and you and I would too. <clears throat> but it even got worse when his three friends showed up. But the Apostle Paul went down an interesting road in order to live up to his name. You may want to write this down. In 1 Corinthians 15, 9, he calls himself the least of the apostles. In other words, I am one of the commanders in the church age, but I don't consider myself the head guy, although he was. So I'm the least of the apostles. And then in Ephesians 3.8, he said, I'm the least of the saints. In other words, you get down where the buck privates are, and I'm, uh, that's, I'm down there. I don't see myself having any great significance in this plan because he knew it was all God's grace. And he stated that many times. And then in 1 Timothy 1.15, he said, I am the chief of all sinners. I am on the bottom. But he had one more step to take to live up to his name because the name Paul is a name of a nobody, an insignificant name. There's no rank, there's no status in the name Paul. But it took the thorn in 2 Corinthians 12 to bring him to the place where he arrived at that moment where he actually said... I am a nobody. But if you look in chapter 11, he goes on talking about all the experiences that God allowed him to go through. And if that doesn't wear you out, just reading it. But then now in chapter 12, he starts talking in a strange way because he's never been dead before. I think he was stoned at Lystra, and God took his spirit to the third heaven and gave him a classified briefing and then he said I'm going to put you back in that body but you are to in no way ever mention to anybody what you saw and what you heard because let's face it if you want to pack out the church just say uh, I went to heaven and I sat down with the trinity and you would not believe what I heard and what I saw he said, don't you ever open your mouth about this experience. Don't you use this experience because it's not your experience that's going to honor me. It's what I was willing to do through you and you trusted me. Now, when the thorn came, you would not believe how many commentaries have tried to explain what the thorn was. It's amazing, all the writing. And the sad thing is he tells you what the thorn was. He nails it a messenger of Satan to Buffett. Now, how could that happen? We're talking about the number one believer in the angelic conflict in the early church, the apostle of the apostles, who have accomplished more than most of them all combined. And then he said, God gave me something to shut my mouth when his mission was to teach and to write scripture. God told him, on this, on this issue, you are not to comment at all. And three times he reacted. I would too. By the way, how can a demon have access to our bodies? You say, well, he had the Holy Spirit. That's true. But he also had an, a security system that you and I have guardian angels. I'd love to know what his guardian angel looked like. I tell people I have three of them. Surely goodness and mercy and to follow me everywhere I go. I have no idea what my guardian angel my wife says he looks like Don Knotts. <laughs> no. 
my dear lady has had to go through so much of my uh, afflictions. What a caregiver, what a champion. She'll always be greater than I'll ever be. I have no illusions about that. But a messenger of Satan to buffet. In other words, an invisible demon had access to punch on Paul. And when you can't see an invisible demon, you can't duck. Three times he, he reacted. Get this off of me now. Take this thing away. And then he stopped yelling. He stopped reacting and began to respond by saying something like, wait a minute. Why am I asking God to take away something that obviously he thought was important enough to put it on me? I forget something. You go to the source. That's one of my greetings to people. I say, may the source be with you. And they go, what? The source, the Savior. May he be with you. He started, he started uh, responding to the circumstance instead of reacting, and he started asking himself, wait a minute, why am I asking God to take away something he felt I needed? Therefore, when he began to respond to this amazing gut check, he goes, therefore, verse 10, conclusion. Now, verse 9 and he said to me, I don't think the Lord spoke to him at that particular time, but he started thinking, look, there's nothing that can come into my life that the grace of God is not sufficient for. I know that, but I haven't experienced that right now, but I need to change my what? My attitude. I need to respond and not react. And when he began to respond, he came up with fantastic promises. First of all, God's grace is sufficient. For what? For everything. Everything. And so his conclusion is amazing. My grace is sufficient for power. His power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I'd rather brag about my weaknesses that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content. Look at the change of spirit here. Look at the difference between reaction and responding. I am content with insults, distresses, persecutions, difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am what? Where does strength come from? It comes from maximum humility. We're not born with humility. I tell kids I, I could lie before I, I, I was ever, uh, ever, before I could talk, I could lie. I'd be laying in my bed with that club foot that I was born with, and I was bored. It was an old dark 30, and I wanted some attention. I didn't know how to yell. Would somebody get out of bed and come over here and pick me up? But I knew something. If I scream like bloody murder, the lights are going to come on. And those fools are going to come and pick me up. So I really lied. <laughs> I started screaming bloody murder. Sure enough, the lights came on. They came and picked me up. I knew it, you suckers. I knew it. I got you. You see, we are born such corrupt little creatures. Cute, maybe. But, oh, you're looking at an old sin nature. Well, anyway, and then verse, when I am this weak, then the power is on me. The weaker we become, wow, the weaker we become in the body, the stronger he is there for us. I had breakfast with Willie Wednesday, and I just, I told him that he was still being prayed for by the church, and he was so excited to hear that. He thanks you, and so do I. But verse 11, I became foolish 
for yourselves, you compel me to actually, I should have been commended by you, for no respect was I inferior to most of the eminent apostles, even though I am a nobody. He finally arrived to the name God gave him, a nobody. And I heard years ago about a guy who was standing on a street corner. He wanted to share his faith, and he'd walk up to strangers, and he said, I'm Mr. Nobody. What's your name? And they'd go, that's your name, Mr. Nobody? Yeah, absolutely. But I'm a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. Do you know my, sa my Savior, Jesus Christ? There's a good line for us, isn't it? Huh? But the more we are occupied with Christ, the more of the nobodies we all become. You think that because I've traveled across the country hundreds of times, that I've stood in front of so many lives, that I have any illusions about the fact that who, who does this through me? But one night, I would, I'd love one, one time to have to tell you about the one night God revolutionized my perspective, and I knew I was a nobody, but I also knew what he could do with a nobody who was surrendered. I hope we have that time sometime. This is not it. He finally arrived at the pinnacle of his greatness when he said, I'm a, I'm a nothing. In comparison to the sufficiency of God's grace, I love Romans 8. I can't tell you how much time I love spending in Romans 8. But verse 32 said, though he were a son, <clears throat> oh, that's, what, that's, that's another one. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things he suffered. I'm not sure I understand that one. But Romans 8, 32, though he spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. When did he do that? When did God do that for you and me? Before we were born. In other words, he, he dealt with the biggest problem we would ever have in all of our life when we were still his enemies. When we were his enemies, he did the greatest thing he could have done. Though he spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us what? All things pertaining to life. The life he's given us. We are secure in the word of God. And when you respond to life, you begin to look at life from what God says, from what God thinks, and all of a sudden, you're calm enough to say, his will be done. His will be done. And if we don't have that attitude, knowing some of us have been here a while, we've been taught by the best, we've all been blessed for the studies that we have had access to, because Ron don't leave anything out. That's why he rarely finishes most of his lessons because there's so much more in there he'd love to talk to you and me about. But thank God he gives us what he, what he has. And I am so grateful for each of you in this church for your prayers and your grace and your friendship. and for your faithfulness to the Lord. Father, I ask for a special blessing for this church. I ask for his leadership and Mama Jane. And a lot of us, Father, who are kind of stumbling through this part of our life, because, Father, I believe rigor mortis never takes a day off. But still, we draw on your resources. We draw on your faithfulness your character, your essence. Oh, how merciful, how noble you are to take care of our, our greatest need when we were your enemies. Now that we are, we are your children forever, may we honor and bring glory to your name. And Lord, I'm asking you for greater open doors, more opportunities to stand in front of the youth with hope, with a message of hope because we're the only ones who have a good message. 
The rest is all smoke and mirrors. Thank you, Father. Sanctify these things, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.